Our scripture reading today is from for, uh, John 1, verse 14. So if you want to pull out your Bibles, I found again that holding this Bible in my hand and reading from it has been a blessing, not just the phone. <laughs> yeah, so John 1, verse 14. And 14 says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And Pastor will introduce our speaker this morning. Uh oh. I am well known for um, for uh, ruining uh, those type of moments. I did this even with the conference president. Happy Sabbath to you. I am very pleased to see such uh, a diverse group of people, uh, different backgrounds, uh, old, young, uh, black, white, Latinos, Romanians, they're good, and Filipinos and uh, we are all here to worship, and the word is going to be br uh, brought to us by um, uh, Elder Peter Cousins. He is the uh, education superintendent for um, uh, this conference, Indiana Conference. I met him uh, six, seven years ago mm -hmm. in North Carolina, where he was uh, stuck there with a <laughs> lousy job <laughs> Principal. teaching. Yeah. Principal. Oh, principal. Oh, principal. And uh, I told him, uh, I was very serious. Why not, you know, moving and do something else with your life? And when God called, he said yes. And listen, we are here together. I don't know if you have the same beautiful house that you <laughs> used to have there. <clears throat> he is teaching... He's in teaching for 26 years, but he looks like he's 30 some years old. Look at him. <laughs> he's like James Bond, never becoming old. He is, uh, as I said, a privilege and a blessing to have people of faith like him and Melissa, his wife, in charge. He's not, they're not in charge telling us what to do but they are casting a vision for our place. And our place deserves to have a larger uh, place to do ministry. Our dream still the same, to invite people from this community to bring their children here and to be educated, not to be uh, good uh, lawyers, electricians, etc., etc but to uh, be in heaven, but to have everlasting life, Amen. but to have that type of characters that is commendable to God. Yeah. Elder Cousins, thank you. All right, good morning. Let's see if this is working here before we go too far. Um, this is going to be a little tricky this morning because the HDMI cable did not reach over here. And my notes are on the so Andrew, I remembered your name because I have a son named Andrew. Mind if I move your chair just out of the way a little bit there? So it's good to be here this morning. I uh, actually grew up in the state of Indiana, graduated from Indiana Academy in 1989. Uh, so Indiana is no, no uh, stranger to me. I was principal at Indiana Academy in 2006, 2007, principal at Indianapolis Junior Academy before that. And... We were in North Carolina the last 14 years before we came back to Indiana. So uh, we've had a great experience, ministry with the Lord, appreciated it. Um, I want to look at one thing with you before we jump into the sermon. We'll have a, just a little bit of education talk, and then we'll, we'll dive right into the meat for, the day, for this morning. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Indiana voucher program, the state voucher program, and uh, they've changed the requirements for this program. So it used to be, you know, a family of five that earned 70000 or less could, could qualify. But notice what they've done now. If you're a family of five 
and you, your family, that is a husband and wife and three kids or a single mom and four kids or however that arrangement is, if you are in $72,000 a year, you qualify. And so it has really opened the door up for pretty much most everybody to qualify for the state voucher. Now, I know there are some people that are a little hesitant about taking money from the state. I understand that. We are, too. This program has been in place now for 10 years. Uh, we have not had to change anything in our curriculum or how we do things. Uh, there will likely come a day in the far future or the near future, however God leads, when that will disappear. I have a feeling when that disappears, that's probably going to be the least of our worries. But uh, while the window is open, we should utilize what's before us. I say that because Nehemiah and Ezra did the same thing. If you remember Nehemiah and Ezra, when they went back to build the temple, who funded that? The government funded it. It was the Persian Empire that took money out of the taxes to fund the building of the temple. If you don't believe me, go read Ezra and Nehemiah this afternoon. You'll be amazed. And God blessed that. And so we are in a situation now where we're not building physical temples, right? We are building little spiritual temples in the hearts of our young people. And so again, God has moved in a mighty way and the door is open for us to utilize money in this way. And I just encourage you to take that step. Many of our schools are doing it and being blessed. And so that information is there. And if you, if you wanted more information about that, please feel free to reach out to me um, on that. So the title of our sermon today is Spiritual Chemistry. Now, I, uh, when I taught in school, I, I also taught at Great Lakes Adventist Academy, secondary. I taught science and math. That was where I loved uh, to be. I taught physics and biology, chemistry, algebra, algebra one and two, and you know all the fun classes that all the kids can't wait to be in, right? Yeah, that's where I like to be. So. Uh, today's sermon is, uh, you're going to feel a little flavor of that coming out of me, I hope, because uh, we're going to be looking at the Bible, and we're going to look at spiritual chemistry, and we're going to look at four things specifically in our spiritual chemistry to make sure that we're balanced. Let's have prayer one more time as we jump in. Father in heaven, Lord, we know that without the Holy Spirit, what I speak here today are just words. So we need an anointing, we need power that I don't have. We need power that is beyond me. Lord, we pray for the supernatural presence of the Holy Spirit to be with us now as we dive into your word. Speak to us this morning, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the Bible, there's a lot of different things we could go to, but we're going to focus just on one thing this morning, and that is salt. Because, you know, Jesus said that you and I, we are the salt of the earth, right? So it would be good to know a little bit about salt because we are supposed to be the salt of the earth. Now, in the ancient days, salt was very valuable because salt was used to, to in a lot of different ways to preserve uh, things, and it was very valuable. In fact, you could be paid in salt, and it's where we, we kind of get the idea of, of the word salary from that. But there's, there's four properties of salt we're going to look at. The first one is, is on, on the picture there. You notice there are two bottles of water. These bottles of water looked exactly the same six minutes before this picture was taken. They both looked kind of mucky, right? They were taken from the same river. But the bottle on the right, they took some Epsom salt, and they put the Epsom salt in the water, and within six minutes, it cleared it up. And so you, as, as the salt of the earth, this is one of the things that you are to do in your community, right? The salt of the earth, you are to help clear up the muck that's there from the culture so that the light of the gospel can penetrate. Light cannot penetrate when the water's mucky. Now, you know in Revelation chapter 17, what's water represent in the Bible? People, nations. So you are to help clear up the muck, to clear up the water, to clear up the people so that they can see and so that the, the gospel can be seen by the God, the light of the gospel can be seen. Now, there's, there's different ways that we do this, right? There's different ways that we help clean up the muck. And some of those different ways, you know, it's our health message, our community service, our disaster relief, our educational program. When we open our doors to the community, 
and we bring people in. Sometimes, you know, when we're talking about education in America, anyways, it's not true when you go to other countries. But in America, I don't know why this phenomenon is true, but we don't always like to use our schools for evangelism. We want it to be a, a sanitized, safe place for only our kids. And, and we don't usually make them into mission schools. But if you go to Africa, or you go to India, or you go to a lot of these other countries, and you go to our schools, and guess what? The majority of the students there are not Adventists. They're not. But in America, we've, we've got that flipped around. And so we don't always use our schools to be evangelistic. Uh, some, you know. So anyways, just something to ponder as you're, as you're processing the schools. When you think about what causes some of the muck in our culture, so you've got to put your seatbelt on for the next couple slides. I just want to warn you, okay? I hope you have worn some steel-toed shoes today because we might step on some toes. Mrs. White says this, the indulgence of appetite is the greatest cause of physical and mental debility and lies at the foundation of the feebleness which is apparent everywhere. Have you noticed lately the feebleness that is apparent everywhere? You know, I went into, uh, I think it was Taco Bell, I went into a fast food restaurant to get a burrito that was like uh, $1.80 or something that I had to pay. I, I gave the, the, uh, the person, the cashier, $2, two $1 bills, and her machine had shut down and she couldn't figure out the change. Now, I'm not kidding. I, it's, there's a feebleness of mind out there. And the other evidence for you that there's a feebleness of mind out there, have you noticed that the homeless population is increasing? Have you noticed that? There are people now who, who are choosing that, and some people who are not choosing it, but they don't have the capacity anymore to hold a job. Now, that's not, that's not all of them. I'm not trying to stereotype. Please understand that. But there is a population out there that the capacity of the mind is becoming more and more feeble. She links it to the indulgence of appetite. She links it to the indulgence of appetite. Notice another statement she makes about this, causing what's causing the muck out there. Satan is taking the world captive through the use of liquor and tobacco. Now fasten your seatbelt. Tea and coffee. I didn't say that. The God-given mind, which should be kept clear, is perverted by the use of narcotics. So the mind should be clear, right? You should have that clarity, clarity of mind to see the gospel, but unfortunately, the things that she names, liquor, tobacco, tea, coffee, narcotics, the brain is no longer able to distinguish correctly. The enemy has control. Man has sold his reason for that which makes him mad. He has no sense of what is right. And Satan, like a flood, has come in, and this is what's happening. And the light of the gospel is not able to fully shine if, when our minds are clouded with these things. And, you know, we're talking about lifestyle issues, and this isn't the only thing, right? We were given a health message for a reason, and it wasn't so that we could live seven years longer. Right? We were given a health message because we needed to have clear minds to stand in the last days. We were not given the health message to earn our way to heaven. It's not salvation by health messaging. That's not the, we were given the health message to have a clear mind. And we've forgotten that. And when anybody talks about the health message, we say, oh, they're legalistic. Da, da, da. And they might be, I don't know. But God, if you read the reason he gave us the health message, the reason he gave the people who need to stand in the last day the health message is so you can have a clear mind to discern right and wrong. Because Satan is coming in like a flood. And his, he is so clever. If Adam and Eve in perfection could not withstand the deceptions of Satan, don't think for a minute that you will. 6,000, 7,000 years after sin has degenerated us, degenerated our minds, don't think for a minute that you're more clever than Adam and Eve. You're not. Or the third of the angels that fell. So it's not just lifestyle, though, that is coming in and, 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 and clouding the mind. It's not just lifestyle. It's also attitude. It's also attitude. And we see this most clearly in sports. We just do. Now, if you remember, I want to 
take you back to um, the disciples. And even in the upper room, even in the upper room before Jesus is ready to go to the cross, one of the things that was going on there, one of the discussions, one of the reasons why they didn't want to get up and wash each other's feet, you remember what it was? They were having this bitter discussion about who's going to be the greatest. You know, James and John's mother had asked Jesus, can my disciples, can my son sit at one side and the other at the other side of you? This offended all the other disciples because they all wanted that position. They wanted to be the greatest. And because of that, even though Jesus very clearly said to them, I'm going to Calvary, they're going to kill me, I'm going to hang on a cross and die, when the event happened, they were not ready because their minds were clouded with this desire to be the greatest. And when you look at the sports world, you know, this is the question, who is the goat? The word goat there, many of you know this, means greatest of all time. It's a discussion very similar to what the disciples were doing that clouds the mind. So our attitudes and, and our desire to be the greatest can also cloud our mind. But it's more than that also in the world, the muck of the culture, there's also philosophies, vain philosophies. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rules of the world, and not after Christ. There are so many philosophies. And it seems like, you know, in about 1840s is when it just exploded with philosophies. You know, Karl Marx, uh, uh, Charles Darwin, shortly after that, the picture there on, on the left of Freud, or I like to call him fraud. And... Uh, some other people, but they came out with all of these philosophies that have their, their roots and their tentacles have gone out now, and they are all around us. You know, the theory of evolution, that there is no God, and, and the idea that, that your whole existence, according to, to Freud, is your identity is bound up in your sexuality. And i got to tell you what, if, if your teenage child has a cell phone and is on social media you should be aware that most of them have bought into this, this philosophy. And, and even if they're not themselves practicing or thinking about it, their friends are, and they think it's okay. They did a survey, 50%. They said 49 points out. 50%, I like to round. 50% of Christian young people think it's okay to be homosexual. And if you think that Seventh-day Adventists are different from that population, you're kidding yourself. And if your child is on social media, we should call it identity platform, because what's happening is they're creating an identity there. And it's not an identity in Christ, unfortunately. Beware. Beware. By the way, this is, you know, this is one of their arguments. I was born this way. Have you heard that before? I was born this way. Why is God mad at me when I was born this way? I was born in sin, too. Were you? David says, I was born and shaped in iniquity. My mother conceived me. How about you? It's not unusual for you to have desires that are contrary to God's word. Am I right? The thief who wants to steal has a desire contrary to God's will. And just because you feel like God made you there, that is not what decides our morality. Desire does not decide my morality. My morality, my identity is decided in the Word of God. And as we, as we approach the last days, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Word of God as our standard, not TikTok or, or all the different social media platforms, all the voices, right? All the voices that are trying to, to reconstruct in us a different identity than what God has given us. And this morning, this is part of the problem that's going on. So as the salt of the earth, as the salt of the earth, we are to be uh, men and women in Christ who are out there helping to clear up the muck of the culture that's all around us. And we could talk more about the muck. There is so much out there right now. You know, and uh, working with young people, I got to tell you, there's, this generation faces so much that you and I never faced. You know, I'm, I'm 51 years old now, and, and when I was going to school, you know, the things that we had to deal with pale in comparison to what they are struggling with. And, and, and most of that struggle, I can tell you, comes from their connection to a cell phone. 
I'm just going to be honest. And, and I'm not saying you can't. There's not ways to control that and monitor that, but let's be real. This is, this is what's happening. Satan is coming in like a flood, and he's coming in through every avenue he can to get to the hearts and minds of our young people. And if, if ever there was a time for us to be vigilant about these things, it's today and it's now. You are to be the salt of the earth in your home. Also, the other, so that's one property of salt. It clears up the muck. Another property of salt is salt makes things taste better. Do you ever notice that? Salt makes things taste better. Now, I don't know if you are a watermelon salter or not. Some, some are, and some are. I am not. My father-in-law is, and he loves to salt his watermelon. And, and I always ask him, why do you do that? And he always says, it makes it taste better. And I say, that makes no sense to me, but he keeps salting it. But salt is to make things taste better, and you, as the salt of the earth, you know, all around you, people are, are hurting. All around you, people are in situations they did not necessarily choose. And so you, as a salt of the earth, you are to help make those situations taste better, right? You are to help them through those times, those rough times. You are the salt of the earth. You are to make things taste better. Now, it's possible, though, for your salt to lose its flavor or its savor. The Bible says savor, depending on which version you, you read. But it's possible for salt to lose its flavor. And how does salt lose its flavor? Notice Desire of Ages, page 306. If Christians are such in name only, they are like the salt that has lost its savor. They have no influence for good in the world. Through their misrepresentation of God, they are worse than unbelievers. And you know, it's very interesting that you, sitting here today, now you've got to just take this serious. You sitting here today, you can be worse than an unbeliever. Do you ever think about that? It's possible. It's heavy to think about. But your influence, if you are not the saver, if you are not making things taste better, you can be an influence and, and, and for, that is worse than the unbelievers. You can have a form of godliness, but you can deny the power thereof. Right? A form of godliness. You come to church, you pay your tithe, maybe, you're, maybe you hold an office, uh, but you don't really have the power of the Holy Spirit living in your heart and in your mind. Get this. This is Desire of Ages, page 309. This really... When I read this for the first time, it kind of blew my mind, but you got to let it sink in. The darkest chapters of history are burdened with the record of crimes committed by bigoted religionists. Whew, the darkest chapters of our history. So you got to think back, whoa, really? Can that be true? So process back in time, you go back a little bit, you see where the Crusades were, right? And, and, and the... the but we don't even have to go that far back, right? We just have to stay within the United States, don't we? Right? To know how bigoted Christian United States was when it came to slavery. And how they tried to justify it with Scripture. Am I right? And then Jim Crow, right? What was it 1896, the separate but equal? And we justified that. And we were a Christian nation, right? Right? Bigoted religionists. And then you can think about the American Indians and how we treated them, right? But look through all history, all history, and it's amazing to think about this. This is really powerful, that when, when the salt loses its flavor and we're bigoted religionists, the darkest chapters of this earth's history are traced there. Worse than unbelievers, she says. Third property of salt. So, so salt is to clear up the water. Salt is to make things taste good. And salt is to preserve. Salt is to preserve. So you look at this picture. These In the top right, you've got some lemons that are being preserved, some fish. So there's some okra. You know, I, I just came from North Carolina, so I had to put you know, something from the south. And then, and then um, there's a picture of, of I, I know we're Adventists, but there's a picture of ham. Now, <laughs> gluten-free. Gluten last, time, last time I preached this, I had this picture up here. One of the guys uh, talked to me after, after church, and he said I should have put a can of Worthington food because it's so salty. <laughs> but we are Christians. We are to preserve a nation. We are to preserve a nation. Notice what Mrs. White says. Were those who serve God removed from the earth and His Spirit withdrawn from among men, this world would be left to desolation and destruction. The fruit of Satan's dominion. Though the wicked know it not, 
They owe even the blessings of this life to the presence in the world of God's people whom they despise and oppress. So the wicked, though they know it not, they owe their continual existence to the righteous. Now that's pretty amazing. You say, how does that work? Is there an example of this in the Bible? Well, actually there is, right? Genesis chapter 18. You remember the story. Abraham is outside. He's kind of uh, sitting out there and he got a visit by three strangers. Do you remember that story? And those three men came up and, and he, he, you know, hey, come and be under my tent and let me feed you. And he feeds them. And after that, of course, that was the Lord and two angels. The Lord says, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Remember the story? And he says, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And instantly, Abraham, poof, light goes on because who's in Sodom and Gomorrah? His nephew Lot and their family. And so, you know, there, he begins this intercessory prayer for Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says, Lord, if there's 50 righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah, will you destroy it? And I imagine, you know, this interaction going on, I imagine God walking away while he's talking. That's my own mind. And um, God says, no, if there's 50, I won't destroy it. Then what, is, what does Abraham do? He starts his bartering, right? Well, what about 45? What about 35? What about tw-? He gets all the way down to 10. And he says, well, if there's 10, will you destroy? And the Lord says, if there's 10 righteous, I will not destroy it. The righteous, as the salt of the earth, you preserve a nation. And it's not just a mystical thing that happens, right? It's, it's an influence thing that happens, as you're part of that community and you're able to influence with your life, with your testimony, with your thoughts, you help preserve a nation. So last property of salt we want to look at is that salt is composed of two elements. All right? So we we kind of, just to recap again, we are the salt of the earth in that we clear up the water of the people, clear their minds up from the culture. We're the salt of the earth in that we make things taste good. We're the salt of the earth in that we help preserve a nation. And now I want you to notice this about salt. Salt is made up of two elements. There will be a test after this. All right, or at least a quiz, right? Sodium and chlorine, right? You've heard sodium chloride. That's what makes up salt, right? And what's interesting about uh, sodium chloride is that it's it's an even... Uh, proportion. So we call it a compound, right? So if you had a pile of salt and you took a spoon at the top and you, you, you were able to separate and see and counted the, the different elements that were there, you would have, for every one sodium, you would have one chloride. And then you took a sample from the middle, same thing. You'd have as many cl- so- sodium particles as you had chloride. And then the bottom, same thing, as many. So it's evenly distributed, one to one ratio. Water is the same way, only the ratio is 1 to 2, right? H2O. So we call that a compound. A mixture is not like that. Mayonnaise is a mixture. And if you took a spoonful of mayonnaise at the top and at the bottom and at the, in the middle, the, the composition of that would not be the same, but the taste would be. I like mayonnaise. It would taste good in either way, right? But it, it might have different proportions of particles. So what happens is very interesting. If you take sodium chloride and you separate it, you take salt and you separate it into these two elements, it loses the properties that it had when it was together. And sodium is very interesting. Sodium is like butter, texture-wise. You can cut it with a butter knife. And if you take it, it's a soft metal. If you take it and you throw it in water, it explodes. And it doesn't just like explode a little bit. It violently explodes. It's really cool if you take some of it and you throw it in a pond. It will skip across as it blows up until it fizzles out. It's really cool to watch. So when you take sodium away from chloride, it becomes explosive. Now chlorine is similar. When you take chlorine away from sodium, it's poisonous. Right? In World War I, they used chlorine to make mustard gas. Okay? Uh, we use chlorine in your bleach, but it's only at 5% mixed with water. So it's really watered down. And by the way, you would not want to drink bleach, right? You used to not have to say that, but you don't want to drink bleach, okay? It's poisonous. It will, it will kill you. Now, I bring this up to show you uh, one-to-one ratio, one part sodium, one part chloride, evenly proportioned so that it, there's, there's a spiritual balance or, or chemical balance there, right? And if you, if you mess up that ratio, you get, a, you get an explosive situation or you get a poisonous situation. So this goes to our verse that we read today. And think about it 
as we're thinking about being the salt of the earth, as we're thinking about sodium and chloride, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the only one Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. Notice it's in a one-to-one ratio. One part grace, one part truth. And when you have that being full of grace and truth, one part grace, one part truth, you have the glory of God. I don't know about you, but I think that my struggle is, personally, has been to find this spiritual balance in my life. To have my, ba- my, lo- my spiritual life balanced with one part grace and one part truth. Because we all come from different backgrounds, right? And some of our backgrounds are more full of truth than grace. And when that happens, it becomes explosive, Right? Uh, people who are full of truth and very little grace are, often tend to be more critical. Am I right? Often tend to be more explosive. It's, uh, they, they don't always want to compromise, right? And so we, we see that. But then the other is true also, that if you're, if you're more full of grace and very little truth, you know, that can be poisonous, right? Because then anything goes. I know many of you have watched, uh, you know, sitting in an airport or sitting someplace waiting to, in line or whatnot, and you see a, uh, a parent interacting with their child. One more time. You do that one more time. One more time. Yeah, have you seen this? One more time. And you're sitting there like, you said it ten times. <laughs> do something, right? Bring some truth into it. And so uh, this balance of grace and truth is something that we all struggle with. Jesus embodied, he was full of grace, and he was full of truth. And I believe so in a one-to-one ratio. Listen to this from Desire of Ages. His messages of mercy were varied to suit his audience. He knew how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. That's really what we're talking about, isn't it? Speaking a word in due season. Right? I had a friend, uh, he was much older than me, and I knew... I just knew this about, his name was George Dunder. He was much older than me. I was a student at Indiana Academy. And I knew that George would give me the shirt off his back. And so George could say almost anything to me because of the spirit that he would say it in. Right? He he really could because he just had a way of saying This is what we're speaking a word in due season. For grace was poured upon his lips that he might convey to men in the most attractive way, the treasures of truth. You see that balance? Grace was on his lips so that the truth would be attractive, just like we are to be. Notice this one also, Desire of Ages. The beauty of his it's talking about Jesus. The loveliness of his character. Above all, the love expressed in look and tone drew to him all who were not hardened in unbelief. Had it not been for the sweet, sympathetic spirit that shone out in every look and word, he would not have attracted the large congregations that he did because he was full of this grace and truth, right? People could sense it when they were around him. And those that were really looking for truth were were sucked in. If you have your Bibles, go to Acts chapter 6 and verse 10. I want to show you another example of this. Uh, We've been reading the book of Acts in our family worship, and we came across this. I had never seen it before. We actually came across this last week. Acts 6... And verse 10, and this is a scene where Stephen is, is talking to, uh, you know, the, he's about to be stoned, you know, that interaction. He's about to be stoned. He's just tried to reason with them. And notice what it says in Acts 6, verse 10, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit which he spoke. Do you catch that? They could not re- resist the wisdom and the spirit. They could not resist his truth or his grace. And unfortunately, sometimes it doesn't always end well, right? There's an, there's an Indian uh, proverb that says, he who speaks the truth must ride a quick horse, right? And that's so true sometimes. But, but you see this, Stephen was filled with the truth and he was filled with the grace. It wasn't enough to just have one, had to be in that ratio of one to one. Notice this. This is from Desire of Ages. I did not realize this. <clears throat> I did not know that in the sacrificial service, they salted the sacrifices. I didn't know that. 
In the sacrificial services, they salted. Listen to what she says. In the ritual service, salt was added to every sacrifice. This, like the offering of incense, signified that only the righteousness of Christ could make his to, could make the service acceptable to God. All who would present themselves a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, must receive the saving salt, the righteousness of our Savior. So you are the salt of the earth. You are to be full of grace and truth because that is the righteousness of Christ. And in fact, if you think about this, you know, because sometimes we think, well, righteousness is some moral external code of do's and don'ts, and I get this checklist, and if I check the checklist and I get all 10 of them right, now I'm righteous, right? The righteousness must go deeper than that, right? Righteousness is not something you do. Righteousness is something you are, something you are by the Holy Spirit. And uh, this is the Mount of Blessings, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, page 18. It gave me a whole nother picture of what the definition of righteousness really is. Righteousness is holiness, likeness to God, and God is love, 1 John 4, 16. It is conformity to the law of God, for all thy commandments are righteousness. And love is the fulfilling of the law. Righteousness is love. You catch that? Righteousness is love, and love is the light and life of God. The righteousness of God is embodied in Christ. We receive righteousness by receiving Him. So as we, are, as we are out there thinking about being the salt of the earth, the question is, have we received Him? Have we received Him as our Savior? Have we received Him as our Redeemer? Have we received Him in His power? Have we received Him? I'm going to jump ahead a little bit because I'm, I'm uh, running, I think I'm running past my time. No? That righteousness of Christ, that salt, that being full of grace and truth needs to permeate not just us personally, but also everything that we do in our churches. You know, to have churches where we are full of grace and full of truth. I, I'll tell you a story that happened in a school that I was working at, Fletcher Academy, um, up in North Carolina mountains. And we had a student who was rumored that he was, uh, well, he had four different girlfriends in many different places, let's put it that way. And so that rumor, we had no proof, that rumor got back to us, and we didn't know what to do. We knew the young man, we knew he came from a very good family, very, very uh, a, a Christian family that was very active in, in, the, in the church. And so I called him into my, I, well, first let me back up, I talked to the chaplain, and we, we together we came up with this plan. And I called him into my office, and he, he came down, and you know, he's a sophomore in academy, so you know, you get the, right? Anybody that has teenagers know the rolling eyes, because uh, somehow in, in, when they turn 14 or 15, they know more than you. I'm, I don't know what, where that transition comes in, but somehow it's like they become an encyclopedia of knowledge and, and experience. But, so I, I called him in, I said, hey, you know, we need to talk to you for a little bit. And uh, we, I said, but let's go downstairs. The chaplain's office was right below my office. We go downstairs, and sitting there with the chaplain, the chaplain's at his desk, I'm sitting right across from the student, and I just laid everything out. I said, look, this is what we're hearing. I mean, I named girls, I named places, I named times. I said, you know, and I know the family you come from. I know, you know, if I call your mom or dad, what are they going to say? You know, that, that got his attention a little bit. And uh, so, and then I asked him, you know, I said, you know, I know you want to grow up and have a family like your family, right? I mean, that's the kind of family you want to have, because I know it's a good family. And he said, yeah, I do. And I said, well, this path isn't going to lead you there, right? So then I stood up, because, you know, when I'm in this interaction, I'm not reading any kind of, you know, sense of response or remorse or, yes, I'm nothing, right? It's just this flat effect. And so I go to the door, and I turn to him, and I said, listen... I don't know if these things are true or not, but I just want to tell you this. I would much rather you deal with this issue in this office, the chaplain's office, than you deal with it in my office. Right? And I left. That's, that was it. Three days later, he, on his, I didn't ask him, he came to my office. He said, hey, can I talk to you? I said, sure. He comes in, and he just broke down in tears and confessed everything. Right? And that chaplain had been meeting with him and praying with him and working with him and, 
And so the Holy Spirit came in and, mo and moved in a mighty way. And so it, this is, to me, you know, when I look back on that and reflect on it, I, you know, what if I had gone in there and just said, you know what, you're suspended. You're expelled. End of the story. End of the road. You crossed the line. Right? What would have happened? But instead, working, trying to work at it through, I mean, we didn't excuse it. Right? We laid out what was, we, I mean, there was no, there was no uh, denying what was really happening. The truth was there but so was the grace, right? And, and that gets you the better results, being full of grace and truth. Sometimes in our churches, we don't always deal with issues with grace and truth. We were just at a church where we moved from. I won't name it. I kid you not. I, I can't make this stuff up. Uh, senior in high school, his sophomore year, his, his father passed away, died of cancer unexpectedly. Then six months later, his uncle died of a car accident unexpectedly. Might have been cancer. Anyways, he died unexpectedly also. So this, this young man loses two important men in his life right away at a very young age. Senior year, he, he's, he, he gets pulled out of our school. He goes to the public school. He gets a girl pregnant. And so um, members of the church go to him and ask him, to marry the girl. They think that's the best thing to do. So he does it. He goes ahead and he marries her. And he and she start coming to church. And he had not been coming to church before this. And they're sitting in the second pew right there. And uh, some of the saints felt like that still wasn't enough. And so they, they uh, wanted him to step down from his office. He was a junior deacon, so he said he would. So that was fine. And so that still wasn't enough. You know, sometimes we like to grind people. Do you ever see that? Do you ever see someone who just wants to grind somebody? And so they decided, some of the saints decided they wanted to do a church censorship of him. After all of that. Anyways, it, it, it turned out actually to be quite an amazing Holy Spirit moment because um, things got turned around and that didn't happen. But I just want you to know that sometimes when we're dealing with church issues, we're not always full of grace and truth. Am I right? Sometimes we, it's easy to be full of grace and truth with someone who's not in our church than it is with someone who sits next to us in the pew, right? To have that same grace with them as well. We need to be full of grace and truth when we're preaching, you know? I, I was uh, at, a, at a funeral with a, um, I think it was a Presbyterian or might have been Episcopalian uh, reverend, uh, uh, lady pastor, and as she was preaching, here in the front row, three, three little kids, second grade, fourth grade, sixth grade, who lost their, her, their mom, who was their only support. Dad's out of the picture. And the preacher's up there saying, you know, God was up in heaven looking down, and he was strolling through his garden, and he noticed he was missing a flower, and he wanted a flower for his garden. So he looked down on earth and he picked this lady up out of the earth and to put her in his garden. Now, how do you think those three little kids who just lost their mom are feeling? What picture of God did they just get? Did they get a picture of God who was full of grace and truth? Or did they get a picture of God who was selfish? And so even in our preaching, we have to make sure that our sermons are full of grace and truth. In our families, we need our families to be full of grace and truth. I remember a lady shared with me one time, she, she was an older lady, she, was, she divorced her husband, and, and you know, um, we were talking one day, and she shared why she divorced her husband. He was the head elder of their church, and she said after church usually, times when they were home alone, he was the most verbally and physically abusive man. Right? Head elder of the church. But in his home... He would beat his wife. And if he wasn't beating his wife, he would have harassed her verbally and put her down verbally. You know, are, are our homes full of this same grace and truth? With the people who know us the best, right? With the people who see all sides of us. And by the way, just as an example also, the family unit, it seems like God has built in, in general, grace and truth. Because it seems like, now I'm generalizing, you know, the woman is more the graceful side. It's why some women are named Grace. You ever see a man named Grace? 
No. And you know this is true because uh, <clears throat> when I was working in the schools, you know, the kids would come in and they'd have, you know, they'd fell on the playground, they tripped or something happened, and they want, you know, two things that we had that were like the cure-all. It was like a Band-Aid or a bag of ice. And, it, and if, you know, they're coming in with this arm, it didn't even matter if you put it on the right arm. Like, this could have been the arm they hurt. You put it on, the, it doesn't matter, it's secure all. You feel like Jesus, you've cured it. But they would come in with something, and sometimes we'd have to call mom and dad to come pick them up because it was, it was more serious. And, and they would be so strong, and holding it together. You know, they're, they're there with the principal, but they're holding it together. Dad, maybe dad comes in first. They're still, but as soon as mom walks in the door, there shall be showers of blessings, right? It is just wailing and gnashing of teeth at that moment. There's just something built in where it seems like men are more, more the truth side, if you will, and women are more the grace side. And it's like built into our families. God designed it that way for a reason. So in order to be the salt, you must experience the salt. Am I right? We're closing now. In order to be the salt, in order to be the one who clears up the culture, in order to be the one who makes things taste good, in order to be the one to preserve a nation, in order to be the one who is full of grace and truth, you must experience the salt. Right? Peter says it this way. This is, this is from 1 Peter 2, verses 1 to 3. Therefore, laying aside all malice. You know, what is malice? Evil, some, some say hatred, evil, yes. All malice, all deceit, hypocrisies, envying, and all evil speaking. Does that pretty much sum everything up? Pretty much sums up everything evil you could do. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word of God that you may grow thereby, now catch this, if, there's an if statement, you will not do away with those things. You will not do away with malice. You will not do away with envy, hyper. You will not do these unless... Or if, indeed, you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Have you tasted that the Lord is gracious? You know, Jesus taught so many parables about this. About the, you remember the parable about the, 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 uh, the guy who was... It was in our Sabbath school lesson, I believe, last Sabbath. The guy who was forgiven 100 denarii or something. He was an, an, an amazing amount of money that he was forgiven. And then he goes out and he finds a guy that owns, owes him like... Uh, a, a, a small fraction of that, and he takes him by the throat and throws him in jail. Remember that? Yes. He did not experience grace, even though he had, <laughs> right? He had been forgiven much, but he, it, never, it never entered his heart to where he translated that toward others, right? He, and sometimes we can be the same way. Here we are in the presence of God, in the presence of the Holy Spirit, and has that graciousness of the Lord touched you in such a way that when you see other people, you say, except for the grace of God, there go I. Right? I could be that person. That could be me, except for God. We need to experience the grace and truth of God in order to be the grace and truth of God. We need to be the salt of the earth. We need to taste the salt of the earth. And I want to close with this verse, Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him.